thank you so much, uh, Punita and uh, Entrepreneurship Awards for inviting me. Uh, as Punita mentioned, uh, I'm just in the midst of uh, releasing my book uh, around the speeches and uh, the various discussions I had as a deputy governor at the Reserve Bank of India until July of last year. Uh, what I thought I would do is uh, touch upon a theme uh, that is very close to my heart. Uh, it's not the central theme of the book. Uh, the book is titled uh, Quest for Restoring Financial Stability in India. Uh, it, is, uh, it is a broader uh, discussion in the book on how uh, the central bank, the government, the markets, uh, the firms, the banks uh, all need to strike the right balance uh, in helping India grow well on a sustainable basis. Uh, but there is a portion of the book that is focused on how we can create uh, the new set of micro entrepreneurs in India. What role can a bank credit uh, play in this uh, in achieving this? Uh, and in particular, how do we democratize credit? How do we sagitize credit so that all individuals in the country with bright ideas might be able to create uh, their credit histories uh, swiftly and get access to formal credit, which is so crucial in the early stages of entrepreneurship to actually uh, evolve into young, successful, uh, budding entrepreneurs of the type that uh, many uh, attending today are. Uh, and uh, if I could, if I could start with a slightly on a slightly different <clears throat> theme before I uh, I give my main remarks. Uh, I've been very closely associated with a charity in India called Pratham. Uh, Pratham is an NGO that is focused on large scale replicable delivery, low cost uh, delivery of education for underprivileged uh, children. Uh, you know, all over India. Uh, and uh, I've been associated with Pratham for over uh, 20 years now. And there are two remarkable things uh, that I have learned about the grassroots of Indian realities, which are very uplifting uh, in my view. Uh, the first is that even in the poorest neighborhoods of India, you go to slums of Dharavi, you go to some of the poorest villages in India. When you visit Pratham's programs and meet some of the parents, what you hear is that even the parents at the last mile, at the last doorsteps, they are keen to get their children educated. Now, that's one side of it. That's the, that Indians have an uh, overarching focus on education. They want their children, regardless of where they are in the economic strata, uh, to study well. Uh, I think it is deeply ingrained uh, in our Sanskriti, in our culture, uh, you know, there's a Saraswati Ma, as you see at the back uh, of me. Uh, and uh, that, that you know, education is the way out. That is the light. Uh, and in, in case of poor people, that's your ticket uh, out of poverty. Uh, but second and more importantly, what I discovered was that a large number of women in India are actually the true micro entrepreneurs. Uh, they uh, they take on the most fascinating services jobs uh, at the last mile. Uh, they start off with very small working capital, sometimes extremely small loans, if they are lucky from formal uh, system, uh, if microfinance institutions or small finance banks or some of our larger banks are there. Uh, and in other cases, they might be borrowing informally, but they start out very small. Then they gradually increase the sizes of their loans. They increase the terms of their maturity. And what is fascinating is that many of these uh, micro uh, entrepreneurs, uh, the women that I'm talking about, they are all moms. Uh, and they are doing this because they want to send their children to schools. In some cases, they want them to go to English medium schools because that's going to be necessary when the kids go to college. Uh, or in other cases, they want to do this because they want them to be trained in computer science where uh, there is uh, an increase in creation of jobs and further entrepreneurship opportunities. Uh, in my view, uh, every entrepreneur starts out small. Every entrepreneur starts out uh, in their study, in their garage, in their uh, in their bedroom with a small idea. Uh, they have very limited capital to start with. Uh, and then the question is, uh, can these bright ideas uh, uh, be allowed to be explored? Uh, not every idea of an entrepreneur leads to success. 
but the way thriving economies grow is that a large amount of innovation and entrepreneurship takes place and formal finance uh, through microfinance credit or bank credit has a key role to play in this uh, let me just also throw in that uh, at least my share of all the proceeds from the book uh, will go to pratham uh, the charity that does work on education it's also doing work uh, during the covid uh, for providing digital content to children uh, all over the country in over 14 states working with a large number of ngos uh and uh, i would urge all of you if you have time and the bandwidth not just to support uh, pratham uh, directly or indirectly uh, but also explore the excellent work being done by other ngos to support education entrepreneurship skilling uh, of the youth in the country uh, let me then turn back to what i wanted to really talk about which is can india's banking system support these kinds of micro entrepreneurs by learning from the shampoo sachet revolution okay so what do i mean by this if you recall uh, you go to a small uh, uh, hotel uh, any in any part of india usually when you go for a shower there is a very small shampoo sachet it's not that easy to open but what is remarkable about it is its size it is packaged at a in a way that its price is very low and almost anyone in india can afford it and this to me is the uh, is really the way that indian banking system can support the budding uh, micro entrepreneurs of the country uh, even seasoned statisticians of course can be thrown off by india's scale uh, india's gdp is currently just short of uh, 2.9 trillion dollars uh, therefore we are the world's fifth biggest economy in nominal terms and the third in purchasing power parity uh, on purchasing power parity terms we are now only behind china and the united states but there is another way to look at these numbers uh, we have a population of 1.3 billion and the average indian makes only 2100 a year in nominal terms and 6900 in ppp terms now on this per capita basis india ranks 142nd uh, in the world rankings so there's a long way to go before everyone shares in the nation's prosperity and as i have been saying what is the way out i believe that education micro entrepreneurship uh, support of this micro entrepreneurship through the formal banking system is the way out in my view now among the first to realize that india is one of the world's most paradoxical markets both simultaneously large in scale but small on a per capita basis was the fast moving consumer goods or the fmcg industry up to the late 1970s most indians were not even buying shampoo this was not because uh, they didn't have hair like me uh, this was because they did not want to Uh, but the average bottle of shampoo cost more than most indians were willing or were able to pay in other words the delivery of shampoo was not in a manner that everyone in india could consume it uh, in response what did the fmcg industry do an ingenious entrepreneur put single use quantities into a small sachet that could be sold for 1 rupee each and the sales just to cough it they had a meteoric rise soon after customers were offered a first rung on the ladder of consumption and this encouraged them to take the next step of consumption fmcg companies in this manner showed that big problems in india can be addressed by providing small clever innovative solutions the act of making affordable bite sized packets out of regular products came to be known as sachetization sachetization of everything from biscuits to body creams changed the fmcg industry in india forever indians wanted the same things as everyone else but they could only afford it one sachet at a time think about the ongoing covid uh, episode uh, in the country clearly the hinterlands the migrant laborers rural india uh, is being served by the fmcg industry very well even in the midst of this problem one they have the delivery at the last mile but also they are selling things in sizes that the average indian can afford and unsurprisingly the fmcg industry is showing signs of actually robust uh, maintenance of this of its uh, sales uh, even during the pandemic 
Now, as a central banker for India, when I was there during January uh, 17 through July 2019, and an account of which is summarized in my book, uh, during that time, I wondered if we could sagitize finance, we could democratize credit to lift people out of poverty. India remains one of the most financially underpenetrated large economies in the world. On the one hand, we have a big non-performing assets problem with our large industrial credits. And yet, on the other hand, we have an underpenetration of credit at the last month. An estimated 50% of the people are employed informally in India. Many of these, in my view, are the true micro-entrepreneurs, like the women I, I was talking to you about. They may earn as much as those in formal employment sometimes, but they remain invisible to the banking system. So when they want a loan, the bank denies them credit unless they can offer a hard asset such as a collateral. But of course, collateral is not that easy to come by uh, if you are at the last mile, if you are below the poverty line. The average Indian cannot provide collateral and therefore ends up resorting to informal finance at usurious, extraordinarily high rates and often onerous terms, not to mention the very uh, inhuman collection policies that are sometimes put in place by these informal money lenders. The underserved Indians are like square pegs. The banking system of India is a round hole. It is no surprise, therefore, that India's credit to GDP ratio stands just around 56% compared to the advanced economies or even China, where it is in the range of 150 to 200%. Uh, when I was at the Reserve Bank of India, we took two important measures to make sagitization in finance, the democratization of credit happen. The first was to initiate steps towards the creation of a public credit registry. The public credit registry aims to be a comprehensive database of information for all credit relationships in the country from the point of origination of credit to its termination. It would include information about whether a loan is being repaid, whether a loan is being restructured, is, has there been a default, has the default been resolved, and so on. It's a complete chronological history from origination to the termination of credit. <clears throat> and the public credit registry is meant to be comprehensive. It would cover all lender-borrower accounts without any size threshold. The primary reason for building a public credit registry or a PCR is to remove the information asymmetry, the lack of transparency that small borrowers face. It would provide the lenders with a 360 degree view of the borrower's liabilities. The secondary reason for creating the public credit registry is to provide bankers with up to date information on the quality of their credit portfolio. So this is the first measure, the creation of a public credit registry. The second measure is the creation of the account aggregator, a new financial institution that manages how other financial institutions access your data based on the consent of the borrower. It enables users to demand their data from their financial service providers in real time in a machine readable format. Now, what's What's potentially beautiful about the account aggregators is that they can gather data from all financial institutions and the concept can possibly be expanded even to your tax receipts, your utility bill payments, perhaps even to your mobile uh, usage and the internet fees uh, for data calls that you are paying on your mobile phone. But the idea is that a lender should be able to see the sum total of all the financial transactions you are doing, credit, non-credit, immediate payments, future payments, etc. So this would cover banks, non-bank finance companies, mobile money wallets, mutual funds, tax receipts, and others who are willing to offer their data over uh, mobile apps. Regulations would ensure that the business model of the account aggregators does not encourage reckless collection of data and of course the privacy of the data would have to be respected so the account aggregators would have fiduciary responsibility to each individual submitting data to them and they would not just be data brokers for the bank uh, the the account aggregators would simply manage the flow of encrypted data and not actually read it 
Together, the public credit registry and the account aggregator can allow financial intermediaries to see in near real time the complex patterns of financial cash flows of individuals and businesses. As I mentioned, this could include your utility payments. For small businesses, this could include even their GST invoices they are if they are above uh, the GST uh, net. But even at the most micro level of the entrepreneur, the history can be contained uh, in the uh, in the public credit registry and the account aggregator based on any financial transactions they are doing. This could be your mobile wallet payments. Uh, this could be your phone payments, data payments, and so on. When these systems kick in, uh, banks will be able to lend judiciously to India's underserved population in terms of credit. By employing the power of big data analytics and machine learning, Banks can then create individualized financial products. They can create credit scores for even the last mile borrowers of India, the last mile uh, fresh young micro entrepreneurs of India uh, and, and for each such user out there. Now, to get back to shampoo sachets, financial services providers must, in my view, reduce the size of the packaging and rethink the formula itself. What is the point of a one-year loan repaid in monthly installments to a micro-entrepreneur who earns only once the investments actually come to fruition or a farmer who only earns during harvest? If the formal financing system can observe the cash flow patterns of these micro-entrepreneurs through other transactions that they are doing, they can start doing cash flow-based lending. Uh, they can start serving the unique needs of Indian customers based on the specific maturity profile of their cash flows. This way, with the aid of smarter technology, uh, there's no reason why we can't raise India's credit to GDP ratio uh, over a period of time and bring it in line with those of more high income nations. To summarize, making cash flow based credit available to every Indian uh, could be a small solution to India's big problem of financial inclusion. Uh, it is my view and conviction that actually if we yeah. have more micro credit, if we have more credit for micro entrepreneurs of the country who eventually will become, some of them will become the big entrepreneurs of the country, that not only do we push India's growth agenda forward, not only do we create skilled jobs, but as I was saying, a lot of the micro entrepreneurs are often doing it to meet their household's needs. Some of these needs relate to the education of their children and therefore access to formal credit for these micro, micro entrepreneurs will also actually keep our young, uh, our youth uh, educated, skilled, even in the most underprivileged parts of the country. Uh, I wish to congratulate uh, all the awardees, uh, all the award winners today. Uh, I'm sure uh, you have bright ideas and businesses that are being recognized uh, by the Entrepreneurship Awards. Uh, and I also wish uh, all the other entrepreneurs who did not make it uh, to the awards the, the very best because entrepreneurship innovation is inherently about exploration. Uh, it need not be the first idea that pays off. But as they say in entrepreneurship, if you fail, fail fast and restart again. Uh, all the very best to all of you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Acharya. I, uh, I was as I was listening to your talk uh, right now. Can you see me? Yes, I can. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, so you made some uh, really valuable points uh, out there where you mentioned that, you know, if entrepreneurs fail, they have to sort of rejig. But in today's time, you know, when the pandemic is probably going to put multiple businesses out of business, so to say, uh, you know, how, how can banks be coming in support of such entrepreneurs? I was asking this earlier also that, you know, digital transformation is something that is the need of the hour today. But, you know, it, it cannot... For an SME, it's very hard to prioritize uh, that kind of digital transformation and put aside funds for it. So do you think there could be some innovation loans that can be extended to uh, uh, you know, SMEs who can then probably find their way much easily uh, than you know, what they are in, facing in current uh, situation? Uh, uh, certainly, uh, I think that's a great question. Uh, COVID, of course, uh, throws many of our traditional wisdoms uh, on its head. 
Uh, and if I could uh, make a, make an interesting point here, perhaps somewhat contradicting myself, but only in the context of COVID, uh, my former advisor and my colleague now at uh, NYU Stern, uh, Professor Marty Subramaniam, he has been arguing that during COVID, what entrepreneurs need is more longer term finance. They need more equity style finance. It may not exactly be equity. If it has to be credit, then it can't be the typical very short term credit. It has to be longer term credit because we are in a fog of uncertainty, uh, as you rightly pointed out. Now, what would give banks the confidence to be able to make these types of loans? Uh, there are two possibilities that are on the table. First and foremost, uh, banks need to be well capitalized. They need to have capital uh, on their balance sheets to be able to absorb losses. Uh, what has happened, unfortunately, in the country is that a large number of banks over the last decade have just been fighting their past loan or legacy problems. And that has prevented them from having the right risk return attitude and approach towards newer and health, newer loans to potentially uh, healthy ideas. So that's one. Uh, I think the banking sector and the non-banking financial sector needs to be in great shape. Uh, but the second thing I would stress is that the Reserve Bank of India, in fact, prior to my joining, uh, started recognizing that we need different classes of financial institutions in the country. We need small payments bank. We need uh, uh, we need small finance banks. Uh, we need micro uh, credit institutions. And I think we need to ensure that this whole range of financial institutions are in good health to allow the entrepreneurs, uh, as you mentioned, who are right now undergoing massive transformation, perhaps in the yeah. midst of COVID, to be able to take up these opportunities. Sure. And, you know, you mentioned that today they need to think in the more uh, the banks need to think in a more equity style way. And I from where I'm looking at things, I think five years down the line, the you know, right now we have sort of a, a, a difference between a startup and an SME with there is more innovation and then SME is more about production and selling. But I, I do see these worlds collapsing together in some way because there is going to be a lot of digitization happening for SMEs. So do you think the financial structure is also going to change? If SME and startup becomes one uh, in the coming years, then do you think venture uh, debt and venture capital is also likely to see some kind of uh, fusion in the coming uh, years? Uh, I, I think absolutely. Uh, you know, um, uh, in fact, if I could push my uh, former advisor, Marty Subramaniam's idea a bit further, uh, their idea is that once this long term finance or equity style investments are made, they could actually be all collected, you know, uh, at the level of India's typical small entrepreneur. Again, these are going to be relatively small size loans. And, you know, it is not going to be the case that you can get a large investor directly into each of these loans. But you can pool a large number of these loans together and create some sort of a fund. So uh, uh, the underlying cash flows will still have credit. But once you pool them together, a lot of the individual risk of each entrepreneurship loan would be far reduced in the portfolio of loans, which is out there. And now you can basically try to securitize that. Right. You know, there could be a safe tranche of this SME portfolio and there could be a riskier tranche. The safe tranche could be bought by those who like to hold debt style paper. And the risky tranche could be invested in by venture capitalists and private equity investors. So while the venture capitalists and the private equity would not be directly lending to each small micro entrepreneur, this could be an interesting vehicle through which we could potentially make this possible. So I think the innovations in finance that take small loans and pool them and securitize them to raise larger financing in markets, it's already out there. We need to figure out a way to put it to good use in the midst of the pandemic. So according to you, this is probably the new semantic of uh, investment banking of the 90s. Oh, uh, absolutely. Uh, I think finance always evolves organically to meet the needs uh, of the of, of the economy as it's changing. I think this has always been a property of finance, financial institutions, newer forms of intermediation all through its history. Uh, and in my view, given the challenges I mentioned for India, uh, what better time to do it than in the midst of the pandemic?
Sure. We'll quickly ask, uh, I'll take a couple of questions that have come up on the screen from some of our uh, uh, delegates. Uh, there's somebody uh, yes, who's asking, please, that, please do you think that the yeah. shape that I... Uh, do you Please think that the shape that IBC is in today will suffice to help businesses given that they are battered by the pandemic? Uh, you know, so uh, see, the pandemic has uh, two features to it. Uh, in, in some ways, the pandemic is accelerating some of the trends that are already happening. Uh, would we have been uh, switching towards e-commerce in five years time? Of course. We would have been. That is the trend uh, that is happening the world over, including in India. The pandemic is going to accelerate uh, some of these trends. But at the same time, the pandemic is creating difficulties for some of the services uh, sector entrepreneurs. You know, they could be in hospitality, they could be in travel agencies uh, and so on. Uh, so there's a combination of two kinds of bankruptcies that are likely to happen, in my view. One is a natural creative destruction as we reorient the productive capacity of the economy from old technology to new technology. And second, where the technologies are going to be needed in future as well, but temporarily there is some sort of a protracted slowdown. Now, clearly for the first transformation, we have to use bankruptcy. Bankruptcy is not punishment, uh, as Raghuram Rajan uh, keeps pointing out. It is a way to restructure debts. Uh, and 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 that has yeah. to happen. Uh, in the second set, there is a scope for some temporary accommodation. Uh, the debt moratoria, etc., have been announced. Uh, I, I'm personally not in favor of the suspension of the bankruptcy code for fresh bankruptcies that has been announced for a whole year. I think that's too long. Uh, it could have been at best been three months, uh, maybe push it a little bit further. Uh, but firms have to restructure their debts. This is the nature of financial engineering that firms have to do to ensure that the right hand side of their balance sheet can is always rightly positioned for the operational side or the left hand side of the balance sheet. Uh, now, if we don't have any debt restructuring possibilities and, you know, prepackaged bankruptcies are not that common uh, in India as of now. Banks are not that willing to actually restructure debts just because of violation of certain thresholds, etc. So if debt restructuring doesn't take place, there is no possibility to resolve debts in bankruptcy and debt burdens keep rising. Uh, I see this as a potential problem for allowing both the cleaning up of the old sectors uh, as well as financial restructuring of those who have temporarily got into trouble. So in my view, we should position banks with adequate capital so that they are willing to take losses and help firms restructure. And perhaps we should consider reopening of the insolvency and bankruptcy court uh, in the next two, three months, in my view. Sure. We'll take one final question um, uh, where Shanu says that a major problem in India is of non-institutionalized non transactions for SMEs and MSMEs leading to black money creation, which is inherent to the way Indian economy works. So how can we approach this problem from a long-term impact on the way India transacts? Uh, that's a, I think that's a deep insight. Uh, I didn't touch upon this uh, directly in my remarks, but one reason why formalization helps, one reason why sachetization of credit helps, one reason why a public credit registry might help is precisely because it's going to make the informal borrowers, it's going to make the informal credit formalized. Uh, I always think about e-commerce as a great example. Anyone can go buy and sell something on eBay as long as they have a decent transaction registry. I don't know most people from whom I'm purchasing items, but once they have a transaction registry, once they are rated by their past transactions and the counterparties there, it gives me sufficient confidence to do transactions with relatively anonymized parties. The same way formalization of credit is about being able to lend to people based on formal or hard coded aspects of their activity rather than having to rely exclusively on informal relationship based data. It has to be a combination. At the last mile, relationships are very important. Informality is important. But what the hard coding of transactions that these borrowers do would help is that it would formalize credit. See what we need. And uh, 
The former Niti Aayog chairman Arvind Panagaria has made this point many times. We want that we create a lot of small businesses, but that eventually some of these small businesses become very large. What is not happening in India much is that small businesses are remaining just small businesses. They are not migrate. Not many of them are migrating into becoming large mega firms. There is not as much churn as we would like uh, in this space. How how can we make this happen? We have to make small business. We have to make it attractive for small businesses to become large. Access to finance is one of the primary reasons why small businesses in other parts of the country want to become large. They they start paying taxes precisely because they want it on their records when they are going to access credit. That oh, I have paid taxes and this is my transaction. This is these are my tax records of the last three years. So once they are in the credit net, once they are in the formal credit system, once they are on the public credit registry, once they can use the account aggregator to show the sum total of their financial activity, I believe that it will be an indirect and I think a more uh, nuanced way of actually dealing with black credit rather than trying to simply say oh i must collect taxes from everyone at all cost because there is no way out they will always find clever ways to actually uh, get around the tax system absolutely no i think that is very well said and i think the, the you mentioned about credit registry and i think now in india when we are getting digital with small businesses platforms like Facebook or Flipkart or other such digital platforms where people are going to sell their merchandise or products or services uh, would actually find it much easier to be able to qualify their merchants, uh, which is otherwise very hard for them. Um, so, I mean, I'm sure you've Absolutely. seen such examples Absolutely. in the yes, U.S. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know, it's like make it easier uh, for them. To do right, right. Absolutely. Like, you know, Amazon score for my book. Uh, 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 the score of uh, uh, of an auction of someone who's wanting to auction items on eBay. These are no different than what credit score should be. Ideally, getting credit score should be as easy as seeing the Amazon score of a book uh, or seeing the scoring of a counterparty right. on on eBay. And I think that is the direction we want bank and micro credit to move towards. Sure. Uh, so I'm now going to ask Kavya to read out the awards for us uh, as we congratulate the winners uh, now. And um, so over to you, Kavya. Thank you very much, Ritu, and thank you very much, uh, Dr. Acharya, for beautifully sharing your thoughts. I think it was a very pertinent question that was on people's minds, and thank you so much for joining us and sharing your thoughts. I'm going to request you to please be with us for the next couple of minutes as we also go about to congratulate our award winners uh, for this fabulous edition of the Entrepreneur India 2020. So let's begin with our category here. Entrepreneur of the Year in Service Business, SEM and Logistics. And the award goes to Mr. Anjani Mandal, who's a co-founder and chief executive of Fortigo. So let's all come together and probably have a round of applause as well. In fact, uh, a little bit about Okay, I think there's a little bit of sound there from the uh, team side. I'm just going to correct it. Let's quickly move on to our next uh, uh, category. Before that, let me quickly share Fortigo for that matter. During the 28 years of their uh, experience in the ITBP and manufacturing, uh, Mr. Anjani, in fact, has led businesses through transformation and various stages of growth. So very, very befitting award there. Moving on to Entrepreneur of the Year in Service Business Financial. And the award goes to... Atul Shingal, who is the founder and CEO of Script Box Advisors Private Limited. Mighty congratulations indeed, because they believe in providing peace of mind by always being available to work along with you as well. Super. Which is about entrepreneurs? So let's move on. Entrepreneur of the year in service business security. Mr. Trishneet Arora, founder and CEO, TAC Security. Congratulations, uh, Trishneet. I will have to put it. Uh, I think I just. Yes. Yeah, I'm going to request Ishan to please uh, put yourself on mute so that I'll quickly announce even the rest of the winners, all the enterprising winners here. Moving on uh, from security, let's move on quickly to entrepreneur of the year um, in the service business. And this time we're talking about food. And the award goes to 
Mr. Jaydeep Barman and Mr. Kalul Banerjee, who are the co-founders of Rebel Foods. So, congratulations indeed to the three of All right, time for our next category quickly. From food, let's now move on to beverage. We're talking about entrepreneur of the year in service business beverage, and the award goes to. May I please say also one of our favorites? We're talking about Mr. Uncle Jay, who's the founder of Bira. Wow! Congratulations, indeed. I'm sure a lot of people are busy saying cheers to themselves in this era with Bira. And uh, Bira, as we all know, is a refreshingly modern beer brand. And I think the way they've scaled, the way they've transformed uh, the entire beer industry, it's amazing. So congratulations. Moving on, we're now moving on to another important sector: Entrepreneur of the Year in Service Business Education. And the award goes to Mr. Ashutosh Kumar, who's the co-founder and CEO of TestBook.com. So congratulations! A very pioneering uh, uh, sector out there in the field of education, Mr. Ashutosh Kumar of TestBook.com. Quickly, our next category is Emerging Entrepreneur of the Year in Product or Manufacturing Business, Healthcare. Again, a very, very pertinent sector here. And the award goes to Mr. Amebe Sharma, the co-founder, and Mr. Shrey Badani, co-founders of Kapiva. In fact, as many of us know, Kapiva is uh, backed by the iconic Bhaidanath Group and combines Ayurveda with the latest technologies to create quality product range. So congratulations to Kapiva. Congratulations to the co-founders. Moving on to our penultimate category very quickly, Entrepreneur of the Year in Service Business, SaaS and IT Services. And the award goes to Mr. Vishwas, Vishwas Patel, who is the Executive Director of Infi Bean Avenues. Congratulations. Ritu, your mic is on mute. I believe you have something to share, yes. Yeah, no, I was, I was just, as I was reading the awards uh, uh, that are going on, I see how many of these companies have actually pivoted where they started from and today, you know, how they are conducting their business. It tells a very different story of their persistence and, you know, able to foresee opportunities. So, yeah, I think whether it's logistics or probably, you know, Bira, that a brand that we everybody loves and how they sort of first went to the restaurants before they went to people uh, to uh, make sure that the, the business was all set and people knew about the product. So I think some great stories over there. Please carry on. Absolutely. In fact, you beautifully shared that, Ritu, uh, about some of these uh, pioneering examples that we're seeing. That also brings us to our final category. The final category, ladies and gentlemen, Entrepreneur of the Year, Real Estate. That's right, Real Estate it is. And let's quickly have the award winner as well. The award in the Entrepreneur of the Year Real Estate goes to Mr. Kamal Khetan, Chairman and Managing Director, Suntech Realty Limited. <laughs> Well, I, uh, you know, I, I do see, you know, these award winners. And so thank you very much for doing the honors, Dr. Acharya. You know, they, they're some of the most emerging companies in India. They're already sort of grown big and become sizable, whether it's cloud kitchens or whether it's a beer brand, which is very own Indian started from India or a logistics company like Fortico, which has been there and have time and again sort of uh, gone back to their roots to figure out how they can improve their business model through technology and lots of other areas. Or even a real estate company like Suntech, which is providing quality real estate, particularly in uh, the western part of the country. Um, so, you know, um, I think the, for me, the Entrepreneur Awards have always been special. It's the 10th year we are doing it. And, you know, we never knew that in the 10th year we're going to want to come, have to come virtual with them. You know, we were thinking of a, like a big bang and going into an auditorium this year from a hotel. And there we are in front of a screen and how times have changed. Uh, but, you know, that's the way it is that we learn to live with these new realities and learn new ways of doing things. And as I say, you know, when five years back, um, five years down when we actually sit down and look back and we'll say 2020 was a blessing in disguise because it made us learn so many things. It made us do uh, so much fresh thinking, which we would never have done otherwise with our business. Uh, sir, Dr. Acharya, some final parting thoughts from you. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Ritu. I just want to thank uh, once again Entrepreneurship Awards, but more importantly, uh, congratulate uh, all these budding entrepreneurs. Uh, I wish your firms the very best. Uh, and if I could end where I started, 
I think uh, to me, a country becomes great, a society becomes uh, great, uh, it becomes lasting in terms of the value it creates uh, for the last mile uh, consumer, uh, the citizen of the country, if we can somehow make uh, the whole more than the sum of the parts. Uh, clearly, uh, entrepreneurship is about innovation. It is about uh, the specific interests uh, of each uh, uh, idea creating agents. Uh, but uh, while you push on your own uh, ideas, I would urge all of you to keep in mind uh, that uh, in the end, we have to make uh, the whole uh, add up to more than the sum of the parts. Uh, on these lines, I would uh, strongly recommend that you consider supporting other fellow entrepreneurs along the line. I think it's not so much about uh, competition as creation uh, that makes uh, a society uh, sort of reach uh, the consumer in the last mile and create more value for everyone at the end of the day. Uh, I think skilling, education, I think these are the primary ingredients uh, that we need. Uh, and I stress both education and skilling because sometimes education is very geared towards traditional jobs. It's not always adapting to where the new jobs are, but therefore vocational training and skilling uh, can actually, and you know, maybe one should be thinking about uh, entrepreneurship schools, you know, how do we make people uh, uh, face some of the entrepreneurship challenges? So so just my, uh, my, my last consideration for all of you, give back uh, to the society as and when you make it really big. Uh, and if along the way you can actually carry some people along, uh, I think your enterprises would be so much even more worth and value to the, uh, to the Indian diaspora.